So I'm going to talk about the public, bank, uh, public option in banking. Where does money come from? Most people think it comes from the government. The only money that the government creates are coins, which compose about one ten thousandth of the money supply. Paper dollar bills are created by the Federal Reserve, which you can argue whether it's federal or not. I won't try to get into that. But uh, Federal Reserve notes themselves are only a small part of the money supply. Even with quantitative easing, you're still down to, you're, it's still only about one fifteenth of the money supply that's created by the Federal Reserve. So when the Federal Reserve creates money, they don't just spend it into the economy, they lend it, which makes our money supply debt based. And most of our money is created by banks in the form of loans. Um, I'll, I'm using this chart because even though it only goes up to 2007, because that's when they quit, when the Fed quit reporting uh, M3, which is the largest measure of the money supply and it includes the shadow banking system, which is very obscure. So M1 is uh, what we normally think of as m money, that's coins, dollar bills, and checkbook money. That's the blue line at the bottom. And uh, coins and dollar bills only come about halfway up that blue line. So you can see that most of the money supply comes from somewhere else. M2 is uh, the circulating money supply that, that we, the people, actually get to use. So that includes uh, coins, dollar bills, and checkbook money, and close substitutes, including savings deposits and individual time deposits. Um, and M3 then adds the large institutional deposits, um, the, the money market funds, the pension funds, mutual funds. So that money actually doesn't even go into banks. They, banks only insure $250,000 uh, in the form of deposits, so FDIC insurance. So if you have a lot of money, like a pension fund, and you want to park it somewhere, or say a stockbroker that, that wants to park some money, a mutual fund that wants to park the money overnight or between sales, they put it in the repo market or the shadow banking system, which doesn't involve deposits at all, but that money is still money that's out there competing in the marketplace and um, adding to the money supply. So how do banks create money? Um, Many experts have said that they do, but this, this, this one it was particularly clear. How, uh, Robert B. Anderson said in 1959, when a bank makes a loan, it simply adds to the borrower's deposit account in the bank by the amount of the loan. The money is not taken from anyone else's deposit. It was not previously paid into the bank by anyone. It's new money created by the bank for the use of the depositor. So this, this chart comes from um, uh, a little booklet called Modern Money, uh, Money Mechanics that was put out by the Chicago Federal Reserve. And it shows the uh, money multiplier model. It's, it's a little obsolete, but it gives you the general idea. You can see that line at the bottom is a, a $10,000 deposit. Uh, if, if you have a 10% reserve requirement, you're supposed to hold back 10% and then you're allowed to lend out 90% of that deposit. That's not really the way it works because they really make loans without regard to their deposits and then find the deposits later. But, but it works out to, the, you know, the bottom line comes out rather like this. So you're allowed to take the, lend 9,000, I guess this doesn't. Anyway, the, so the second line would be the 9,000 that, that would then, your, your borrower will write a check which will go into another bank. And then that bank is, uh, holds back 10% and is allowed to lend 90%. So it would lend 8,100, so that would be the third column up. So when you keep doing that over 20 iterations, $10,000 becomes $100,000. But you'll notice that the $10,000 is still there as a deposit in the bank. The $9,000 is still there. The $8,100 is still there. So, so you basically double counted all that money and that's, that's how the money supply expands. There are two ways to look at it. They didn't really create anything. Really what they did was they just kept making loans. But because they're in two different accounts, both of which count that deposit, and when they count the money supply, they count the deposits, then in that sense, the money supply has expanded. I mean, you could picture it like, let's say your grandmother had $10,000.
$100 under her mattress that she wasn't using. And if you borrowed it and you went out and spent it in the economy, you wouldn't call that an expansion of the money supply. And yet, it did expand the money supply because you're out there competing in the market for goods and services, whereas when your grandmother had it, she, didn't, she wasn't using it. But if she had it in an account, and it, if you were a bank and you made a loan in another account and it was still sitting in her account, then they called that an expansion of the money supply. So it's all kind of just a technicality, whether banks create money or whether they're just lending and relending money. Still, it, it does, all that extra bank created money or loans competes in the marketplace and um, that's, it's that credit on which we run our economy. So that's the, mon that's the money that we have available for trade. Our, our whole money system goes back to uh, the 17th century. Well, it actually goes back thousands of years. It depends on how you want to look at it. But um, the, this particular system of bank-created banknotes goes back to the century, 17th century goldsmiths who would take people's gold for deposit and um, write little receipts for them called banknotes, which was supposedly represented that sum in gold. And the people preferred the banknotes to the gold. They didn't want to carry the gold around. It was heavy and it could get stolen. And other people would want to borrow the gold, and they too preferred the little paper bank notes over the gold. So the, the, bank, uh, the goldsmiths quickly discovered that they could lend many times more notes than they had gold. And that, in that sense, those bakers definitely did multiply the money supply. I mean, they were actually just printing bank notes that were backed by nothing. Nine out of 10 of them were backed by nothing. And that was the beginning of the 10% uh, reserve requirement. The problem with that whole system is the interest. The banks would always lend, lend this money at interest, of course, and they created the principal, but they didn't create the interest. So where will you get the interest? Um, either someone has to take out another loan or, um, somebody has to default, you know, it's like a big game of musical chairs, and if there aren't enough chairs, then somebody has to default. So right now we have both things going on, where you have debt expanding and expanding exponentially, and you have people going into default. And what it creates is this pyramid scheme, or um, an unsustainable exponential growth. It's like a parasite on the side of the economy, which isn't feeding into the economy, but it's just uh, extracting money out so so that the capital account that that this interest is going into uh, is always expanding I mean they always want more money back than they put out it's always a loan it's not an expenditure so here are some interesting facts from all that uh, Margaret Kennedy is a German researcher who has collated the cost of production at various levels of production of a product and most businesses run on credit, so they have to pay their workers and materials before they have a product to sell and before the end buyer has paid 90 days net. So in that, for that whole period, they have to operate on credit. And if you add up all the, all the um, borrowings of all the stages of production, uh, whole, wholesalers and retailers, etc., then 35% of everything we buy is interest. And 29% of business profits go to the financial industry. So you could deduce from that that if we owned the ba banks either, we would be 50% richer because if you knocked off that 35% off the top, you could buy three things for the price of two. Or we could have an extra trillion dollars annually, we collectively as a people, to spend on all those things that they tell us that we can't afford and that we have to be tightening our belts and selling off public assets and um, slashing services and firing teachers and so forth for. Or we could eliminate income taxes altogether. So I'll show you the figures on that. Um, in 2011, our income taxes were uh, $1,100 billion or $1.1 trillion. The total interest collected by banks was $725 billion, and the total interest paid on the federal debt was $454 billion. So assume that, that uh, 
we borrowed only from our own central bank, as has been done by various countries. I'll get to that. Then we would pay no interest, or in effect, the, we would collect the interest back from ourselves. So in effect, it would be interest free. So we would save 454 billion plus, I know it's when it'll be a long time before we have a totally public banking system, but just hypothetically, if we did, and you added those two things together, you get 1.179 trillion, or actually more than we paid in income taxes. That was actually done in colonial Pennsylvania. The American colonists devised this brilliant system of just issuing paper script, government issued, that this was competing with the banker issued bank notes. In fact, the paper script came out a little earlier than the bank, well, than the Bank of England's bank notes. Um, the, the colonists didn't have gold and silver, so, so their option was to borrow from the British bankers who didn't really have the gold and silver either. They were issuing, they were just issuing paper notes and they were charging interest on it. And there weren't even that many banks around. So even if you wanted to buy from, borrow from a British bank, it was hard to do. So there just was a, a scarcity of money to, for um, productivity and growth. So in uh, 1691, uh, the governor of, the Massa of Massachusetts was fighting a little wo local war and he needed to pay his soldiers and he couldn't find anybody to borrow from. So he just issued these little paper receipts and the, they were just acknowledging that um, service had been performed for the community and that the community owed that back to him, to them. And then the soldiers would spend those little paper receipts in the community and they circulated as money and they were accepted as money because the government would accept them back in taxes. So that's what gave them their validity and stabilized their, their value. So that worked very well except that the governors of these colonies were um, foreign imports, so this, that was the whole taxation without representation thing. These were supposedly backed by taxes, and if, if you taxed later, you would bring the money back in, so you would avoid hyperinflating the money supply. But because it was hard for the governors to tax, nobody really wanted to pay the tax, they would wind up just printing and printing and printing. So they, they wound up hyperinflating in some colonies, devaluing the currency. But in Pennsylvania and some other co uh, colonies, but particularly Pennsylvania, they perfected it. Um, and that was Benjamin Franklin's colony, so, or where he moved to when he was 18 and started writing about it and became known as the father of paper money. Uh, in Pennsylvania, they had a bank. It was a land bank, supposedly uh, backed, but the, their currency was supposedly backed by land. And they would print, um, currency or a paper script. And instead of just spending it, they would lend it. So you could print, for example, $105, lend $100 at 5% interest, spend $5 on your government budget. So you've got the money out there for the interest, unlike our current system. And then the whole 105 would come back as principal and interest. You could lend the 100 again, spend the five again. It would all come back as principal and interest lend the hundred, spend the five, et cetera. So it never, you never had to expand the money supply to make the system work. And during the time they did that, um, they did not, the prices did not inflate. There were, they paid no taxes and they had no government debt. So it was a totally sustainable and brilliant system. Uh, what ended it was not like Rome where, you know, the debts caused the downfall of the, of the civilization, it was invasion from outside, or in, in this case, it was the, it was the King, King George just forbade them to do it. And then the colonies, that caused a depression because it shrank the money supply. And so the colonists just went on printing their money anyway, and that was considered an act of rebellion, and that was one of the causes of the American Revolution. So we won the revolution, but we lost the ability to, um, print our own money. It's a bit complicated how that happened, but so I, I won't try to go into that now. It's all in my book, Web of Debt. Um, Abraham Lincoln revived the, uh, the system of issuing, pay, uh, well, government issued money. These are the greenbacks during the Civil War, and that worked very well. It uh, expanded the money supply. Not only did the North win the war without going heavily into debt to the British, or to the 
British and Wall Street bankers, as the bankers always, they always wound up the winners in these wars because they would fund both sides. Um, but they also funded things like there was, they built the railroad across all the, across the country during that period and other, other remarkable expansions of the economy. But he was obviously assassinated and the money supply shrank again. And um, so there, was an, there were waves of depression after that. It also shrank because silver was demonetized, which meant that it used to be that you could back your paper money either with gold or silver, but that the silver backing was removed. Silver was considered the money of the people because it was a lot easier to get than, um, than gold. So, um, so there was a whole populist movement in the 1890s to try to get government issued money, go back to the greenback system of Lincoln, which was actually the paper money of the American colonists. It's their brilliant invention that was suppressed by the British, by the Bank of England. Um, either, it, both for the government to issue its own money and for the government to own the banks, that was part of the populist platform. And uh, The Wizard of Oz was actually wit written as a monetary allegory in the 1890s. That's the theme of my book, Web of Debt, and it was actually what prompted me to write when I learned that. Um, there, was a, there was a march on Washington in 1894 of a group of greenbackers who went all the way from Ohio to Washington, D.C. on foot or horseback, as you can see. It, trying to get Congress to go back to Lincoln's system and to issue, they had two bills. One was the Good Roads Bill, where they would issue money to build roads, rather like Roosevelt did. And the other was a bill to, that would allow um, Congress to print money and lend it to the local governments. But they were, they, they didn't win. I mean, they, it didn't happen, obviously. They were turned away at the gate, just as the keeper of the gates turn, turned Dorothy and her friends away. And, uh, but meanwhile, in other, other countries, they carried on with this model of uh, either government bank created money or government created money. Um, one was in Australia from 1912 uh, to 1923. The Commonwealth Bank of Australia was it was it was government owned, but it, it actually was government owned. And the the governor of the bank was a banker, and he knew how banking works. So he decided to just use this tool and to issue credit for everything in sight that was good for that for Australia. So they would build roads and seaways and fund. Um, well, they funded a shipping line that competed with the British shipping line and was threatening to overtake it. And they funded Australia's participation in World War I. Uh, the governor made the mistake of going to England and bragging about this in, uh, in the city of London. And of course, that would totally terrify the, the, the London bankers, the way they had kept control of their colonies. They, that, that they had lost politically was that they kept economic control. They were supposed to be the source of funding for all these colonies. So the, the governor um, died rather, rather suddenly after that of a heart attack. And, um, and then they changed the system so that the, the, that was the beginning of the central bank system where instead of the treasury issuing the money, uh, the central bank would issue the money and lend it to the government and the central bank was supposed to be in this pyramid underneath the Bank of England which would be the head of this whole system and then later the, the governor from the Bank of England who came out and chastised the Australians for being for this frivolous printing of money that they were doing uh, he went on to become the head of the Bank for International Settlements so you can see that this whole structure moved over to Europe, the Bank for International Settlements, which is what now keeps control of the whole banking system. I don't, I don't have time to go into all that, but that's, I'm writing a book on that now on public banking and the um, historical and global models that we have to, to copy from, of, wh of which there are many, uh, but they've typically been suppressed. They don't, they don't 
fail of their own accord. They're suppressed from the outside by, by the Bank of England and the international bankers. Uh, from 1939 to 1974, Canada borrowed from its own central bank. They, they nationalized the bank in 1935. And then, then they started borrowing, so they were effectively borrowing interest-free because they got the interest back. And during that time, their debt did not, uh, you can see that it remained level, uh, and they did remarkable things. They uh, funded Canada's participation in World War II. They did education benefits for the soldiers, family allowances, old age pensions, highways, seaways, and probably the most amazing thing was that they set up their universal healthcare system, which was really a great system originally. It's not so good now because, because they've quit borrowing from their own central bank and started borrowing internationally. That was when they joined the Bank for International Settlements in 1974 and got with the program, you know, which was supposed to be to maintain the value of the, the currency, which meant you couldn't borrow from your own central bank and you couldn't print your own money. And since then, they've been heavily in debt like everybody else. But that was a, an excellent model for that period, 35 years. This is a chart put out by a group that says that we have to, we have to get rid of the entitlements that you probably know who I mean. <laughs> but anyway, we have to get rid of the entitlements that the entitlements are killing us. But you can see from this chart, the entitlements are Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. They're the, the purple and blue and green lines. And they're, they're, you could actually maintain that whole debt. That's a sustainable debt. What's growing exponentially is the interest. So if you got rid of that interest on the top, um, you could sustain a very nice debt. In fact, we've had a federal debt ever since 1835. That was the last time it was ever paid off when Andrew Jackson pulled the money out of the uh, second U.S. bank and paid everything off. And we've been quite wealthy during that time. I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't hurt us. So a, a, a modestly, linearly growing debt is not a bad thing. It's that exponential part that is the killer. The case has been made that if France had borrowed from its own central bank all along, they would have no debt today because their debt increased by 1.35 billion euros in the last 40 years. And they paid the, the same sum in interest in the last 40 years. And in Canada, they paid twice as much interest as the debt is today. It's, I, it's hard to find the figures on the U.S. debt, but the, the Federal Reserve does give the interest that's been paid for the last 24 years. So I added up all those, all those I went back and added them all up, and it came to $8.2 trillion in, in a mere 24 years uh, out of a $15 trillion debt. So that's more than half the debt is interest. And if you went all the way back to 1835, I'm, you could have, maybe arguably we wouldn't have had a debt at all if we had not had to pay interest. In other words, if we'd been borrowing from our own central bank all along, which is what the Japanese do, and that's why they can they can maintain their status as um, as a major exporter. And I mean, they're actually doing quite well, even though they have the worst debt to GDP ratio among all the major countries because they owe the debt to themselves. Margaret Kennedy found that cutting out interest cuts the average cost of public projects by 40%. So it, it's different for different projects, 12% for garbage, 77% for public housing, but if you average them all together, it's 40%. So I'm from California, so I know the California figures, but uh, California has, in 2010, they had a, a general obligation and revenue bonds outstanding of 158 billion. Of that, 70 billion was interest. So that's 44% was interest. So if California had been borrowing from its own state bank all along, we would be $70 billion richer. And so instead of, we've had a deficit of, it's varied, like 24 billion, it went down to 8 billion, I think at one point, and now it's going back up. But so for this reason, our schools are being shut down, teachers are being laid off, marvelous things are being sold off, like our post offices that were built during 
the New Deal that have all those wonderful paintings and carvings on them, all in the name of a deficit that we needn't have at all. If we, if we had borrowed from our own bank, we would be 70 billion in the, in the black in California. So local government, state, county, city, obviously can't print their own money, but they can have their own bank, which means they can create credit in the same way that all banks do, and in that way they, they can expand the money supply and they can save on interest and do good things for their community. We only have one state that actually does this, that's, the bank of, uh, that's North Dakota. Um, it's also the only state that escaped the credit crisis. It's had a budget surplus every year since 2008, while all the other states were are struggling or are almost on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, it has the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest foreclosure rate, and the lowest default rate on credit card debt. It's had its own bank since 1919, when the um, farmers were losing their farms to the Wall Street bankers, and they decided to um, get organized. And it was the nonpartisan league, so it was neither left nor right. It was actually a third party <laughs> win, which rarely happens. But they pulled it off because it was not about left or right, it was about going local. They wanted to get their money back into the state to use for local purposes, and it, it's worked out very well for them. The model is that by law, all the state's revenues are deposited in the bank, so they have a huge deposit base. And they also, all the agency debt is, uh, you know, the state agencies also deposit in the banks. So they have what are called core deposits, which are from the state itself, and then non-core deposits, which are equal to the core deposits, and those are from the state, the agencies all around the state. So they have a very large deposit base, and then they can use that to back uh, an equal sum in credit. Um, they also, ha they're set up so that the bank is a DBA of the state, so it's set up as North Dakota doing business as the Bank of North Dakota. So technically, that means all of the assets of the state are assets of the bank. They, di they didn't use that as their, as their, to meet their capital requirement in the beginning, and that would be pretty bold to actually do it that way. But you can see that they're pretty much untouchable. I mean, they have a huge deposit base, a huge asset uh, capital base. There's not much that, say, the Bank for International Settlements could do to bring them down. They, and they're not FDIC insured, and so the FDIC can't do much to them. They, some people say, well, that makes them risky that they're not FDIC insured, but FDIC insurance only covers $250,000, and obviously the state has much more in the way of deposits than $250,000. So it wouldn't do them any good. It would put them at the whim of what is theoretically a public organization, but it's funded by, by all the banks that put in, that pay their premiums for this insurance. So the banks obviously have a big say. So it's not necessarily something they would want to give um, the power uh, to regulate to. So, uh, the BND has many advantages for the state. They pay an, a very nice dividend every year. Um, in the last decade, they've paid $300 million, which may not sound like a whole lot, but uh, North Dakota is one fifteenth the size of LA County, so so for a state of that size population, it's a pretty pretty nice return. They've had a return on equity since two thousand eight, when other states were struggling, of nineteen percent to twenty six percent. You could compare that to the California pension funds, which are the largest pension funds in the world which lost 25% and 30% with their money in Wall Street the two years after the 2008 crisis. Uh, the bank pays 5% on deposits, that includes CDs, but that's a, that's a very nice return for, I mean, it's certainly um, within the ballpark of other banks. They provide a direct credit line for the state so, so the state doesn't have to keep these massive rainy day funds. You know, 
you might have heard of the CAFR funds, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report shows all this money that's tucked away in funds from agencies and municipal governments and it's just sitting there growing a teeny bit of interest and doesn't seem to be doing anything at all. So what's all that money doing there? It's because all those municipalities and agencies, they don't have direct credit lines. So say, say a local government, I, I was actually invited to speak at a, um, a conference of uh, finance officers in Missouri. So I said, so what are, what are, this was when the whole CAFR thing came out a few years ago, and I said, so what are all those, the rainy day funds that you keep, and why do you keep them? And they said, well, it's actually happened that they would miscalculate the budget, and the whole city would come to a standstill until they could, they'd have to do another bond issue, or, you know, they'd have to go to the voters, or they'd have to borrow at quite exorbitant interest rates. So they feel it's safer to keep these rainy day funds. But it's just wasted money. If you had a, a credit line with your own bank, as Wall Street has with each other, you know, the, the Fed funds rate is now 0.25%. So they can all, they, they get this very cheap liquidity from each other. And meanwhile, the states have to do bond issues, borrow at 4 or 5% or 8% or whatever. If you're Greece, it's 30%. And, and you leave yourself vulnerable to, um, to the rating agencies and you have to get interest rate swaps, which have turned out to be a horrible scam that have killed a lot of city budgets. So if you have your own credit line with your own bank, that's a very big deal that you can get credit when you need it. Um, the Bank of North Dakota partners with the local banks, so, so it, it, in, it guarantees their loans and increases, helps them with the capital requirement and helps with liquidity. So it increases the size of loans that local banks can undertake. Uh, it guarantees stable low interest rate for state and local government projects, provides low interest loans for particular things like in North Dakota, it's an agricultural state, so they gave 1% loans to startup farmers and they give low interest loans for alternative energy, that's one of their projects. Um, they, but they, they have a mandate to serve the state, a mandate to serve the public. And so they're not there to churn loans and they're all civil, civil servants. I mean, they don't get bonuses, fees and commissions for, for turning over loans. So, that, so they do only credit worthy loans. They, we have a, um, I'm president of the Public Banking Institute and we have a retired Bank of North Dakota man on our advisory board, and he says that they make it clear that we are not a development bank, we are, we are not politicians, we are bankers, and we, we, take, we only do credit-worthy loans. You know, we, we bank very conservatively. They've been, bank, they've been doing this for years, so they've built up a very nice um, f uh, capital, fund from the, the, the profits they made on loans, many of which were federally guaranteed loans that could not have otherwise been taken by the local banks, because I guess like for VA, FHA, um, the student loans up until recently, it, you had to have, an, I don't know, a bigger staff than, I, I'm not sure that Jared can really talk about that, but you have to have a bigger staff than, than your typical local bank has, so they couldn't take those loans. But they're federally guaranteed, so that's like a free 3%, free, it's just free money that we're giving away to Wall Street, that, that would be our people taking out the loan, but Wall Street gets the loan and gets the, gets the interest, and it's guaranteed by the government, so they're not taking any risk. So in North Dakota, the Bank of North Dakota took those loans, so they've, over the years, they've built up a very nice capital account. So when they do anything that's at all risky, it's with their own money. They are not gambling with the state's money at all. They're not using the state's money. And then they give um, cheap credit lines like for, for disasters. There was a, recently there was a flood, what was it Fargo, one, one of the cities? Anyway, it was a city that was on the border. I'm not sure it was, that was the one. It was, it was on the border and the, the side that was the North Dakota side in a couple of years was all rebuilt and you couldn't even tell that any disaster had occurred. But on the other side of the border, it still looked like a major 
disaster area because they did not have this instant credit line where they could they would have access to cheap funds to rebuild with. Some people say that North Dakota is uh, an oil state and that explains why they're doing so well. But there are other states that have um, even more oil than North Dakota does that are not doing so well. And globally, 40% of banks globally are publicly owned. These are largely in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which all escaped a credit crisis and are doing remarkably well. In the last decade, they've grown by 92% collectively, those four countries. And they're, uh, you can tell by this chart, they're due to overtake Western countries soon. Uh, we, we do have 20 states now that are, have brought bills of one sort or another for publicly owned banks. We haven't won any yet. <laughs> we haven't actually succeeded, but we're in the second round. You know, we've, we, now we understand what the opposition's gonna say. We know what mistakes we've made. We know where, to, where we can come back strong. And there, there's growing interest in this whole idea. So, so we're, we're on our second push here. Uh, uh, on our website, publicbankinginstitute.org, we have uh, ways that you can, there are information on how to set up a bank, but here's generally what you would need to do. You, first, you have to get legislation passed. So that means you either have to get a legislator who's, uh, who's willing to, to bring a bill, or you could do an initiative. Colorado's doing an initiative. I think the problem with the initiative right now is that people don't understand what you're talking about. So if you went into a, a grocery store and you said, would you like to sign my petition for a public bank? They would say, well, I don't like banks or I don't like government or they, they just wouldn't understand why, why this was a benefit to them. So, so that's what the first thing we need is a, just informa getting information out there, changing decades or centuries of brainwashing in the other direction. And then you need, you need to get a charter, but that's actually not very hard. You could just buy a failed bank. This could all be done in about three months. You could buy a bank and um, the, the bank would already have the charter from the state and it would already have FDIC insurance, assuming you wanted the insurance. And then you have to raise capital to meet your capital requirement. I don't, Jared might be able to talk to this too, too but I heard, or I used to hear that you could set up a bank for five million, but now it sounds like it's more like 20 million. But you could say if you wanted to do a city bank or a county bank particularly, it wouldn't take, take that much in the way of capital. And you could get it by doing a bond issue, which is what the Bank of North Dakota actually did. And if you're, there, there's all sorts of money sitting on the sidelines now, as they say, looking for a good investment. And people want something sustainable that's helping their community. Well, this is something, if they understood what we're talking about here, it definitely would help the community and it's a, a good, solid investment guaranteed by your government. Or they could tap into some of those funds that are sitting around not being used for much. In California, the treasurer has a treasurer's pool, treasurer's investment pool, that has $70 billion in it. And it's, it's earning 0.49% interest. So it's earning almost nothing. And if you look at a chart of this fund, it's done nothing over the next last decade. I mean, they haven't really used it. It's just money sitting there. All the agencies put their money into it. So, but you can't use it for the budget. In fact, um, Governor Schwarzenegger tried to get the highway fund money to use for the budget and somebody sued and the court said, no, you, you can only use that money for highways. I mean, they haven't used it for highways because the highways aren't in very good shape. But anyway, that, that money's all sequestered and um, earmarked for specific things. But what you could do is use it as, just shift the investment. I mean, it's up to the treasurer what he puts, what he invests in. Um, I think it might be stretching it a little bit to put it in bank stock of a state-owned or publicly-owned bank. but. But you could certainly change, tweak the legislation. I mean, we've seen so many examples of the legislation being changed when it serves the banks. So there's no reason they couldn't change the legislation a little to serve the public. And then you would need deposits, but you can get those from the revenues of the local government. 
Um, one possibility for what you could do with a publicly owned bank is to tackle the housing crisis. There, um, there are always, already things called county land banks, which are usually they go in on a tax lien and they take properties by eminent domain. They're, these are the, usually the blighted, foreclosed, abandoned properties that are ruining the property values in the neighborhood. And they take those and then they fix them up and then they do whatever, to resell them or rent them or whatever. Uh, but they, for one thing, they have trouble finding the money to fix up these properties. But now we have this, um, legis or lit uh, many cases in many jurisdictions finding that MERS, the Mortgage Electronic Registration System, oops, the, um, it's an electronic database in the name of which more than half the properties in the country have been um, recorded. They're recorded in the name of MERS. And it's really this big smoke screen behind which uh, the shadow banking system is doing, leveraging your real estate 30 times over, selling it off to multiple investors, chopping it up into little pieces. That's all, that's the backing for the shadow banking system, which I think the whole system is wrong and we could fix all that by turning it all into a public system. But anyway, in the meantime, we have this system where in order to allow all that shifting around of real estate, they, they record the property in the name of this mortgage electronic registration system. But courts are increasingly holding that MERS cannot hold title. It's only, it's not a beneficiary. It's only a placeholder for the real beneficiaries. It can't hold title, it can't convey title, it can't transfer title. You know, to transfer title to real estate, you're supposed to have signatures from like the, the original owner and then you're supposed to have the next thing. It's supposed to be wet signatures of, of one holder after another. So these courts are saying that violates hundreds of years of property law. It's destroyed, it's destroying the, um, the records, of the, the county land records. Nobody knows who owns these properties anymore because they, they all have this fake name on them. So let's say you went in with your county land bank and you said, we're going to take these properties by eminent domain. Anyone who can prove title, we will pay fair market value. Well, nobody's gonna be able to prove title, that you're putting the burden on the banks now. Right now, the homeowner could do that, but the homeowners never have, they're, they're broke, you know, they can't afford the attorneys, and they probably can't find an attorney that knows these arguments, and they're afraid to, you know, to cross the bank, they're afraid they'll lose whatever leverage they already have with the bank. So they're, they're not in a good position to do it. But the county would be in a very strong position to say, um, you know, prove title. If you can't prove title, then you have no claim to this property. So they could get not just the blighted, foreclosed, abandoned properties, they could get the underwater properties for free. And then what they could do is turn around and renegotiate with the, with the homeowners at fair market value or, you know, work it all out, do some fair deal. Because right now, the the creditors do not want to work it out with the, the homeowner. They've got all the leverage and the home, they're not listening to the homeowners. They, the banks say, well, we, don't, we, don't, we can't do it because there are all these investors that really own it. And then the investors want, either they want 100 cents on the dollar or they're not put in a position to be able to talk to the, to the homeowners. Anyway, so, so you have the situation where the homeowner is taking the whole hit for something that was the fault of the banks. The, the, the housing market dropped by 50% because of a banking crisis, but the homeowners, not the banks, and not the investors have had to take the hit. So that would be a way of working it out fairly, plus putting a nice, a nice bunch of equity into this county bank. So if you actually put your county revenues in, in it as well and used it as a depository bank, you could leverage all that, all that money that you just gotten access to, to create credit for the state, for the county and do many good things for it, like possibly save the government from bankruptcy. The, the one, uh, San Bernardino County is considering a, a proposal to take underwater properties by eminent domain. And there, San Bernardino, the city, is actually filed for bankruptcy. So they're quite desperate. <coughs> 
and people are telling him, oh, you can't do that, but the, but the, um, the board of, whatever, the board of supervisors or whoever runs the, the county, they're desperate. So that's when people, when people are desperate, that's when they start thinking of these more creative ways, like, well, they've, they told us we couldn't do many other things that we actually did. You just have to tweak the rules a little bit. A publicly owned bank can raise government revenues without raising taxes. So they can do it with this big dividend that, in other words, they're returning the profit to the government. And they increase the tax base by increasing the credit generally in the, in the economy, which allows uh, businesses to, the first thing you have to do is get demand going. You have to get money into the pockets of the, the buyers and that means the consumers. So that means you're gonna have to somehow give these people jobs so that they have the money to go spend and then they put in more orders for shoes and then the shoe, that doesn't drive up the price of shoes. What it does is the shoe salesman puts in more orders with the manufacturer, the manufacturer hires more people and they make more shoes. So to get this whole system going again, you need to get money into the pockets of the people. And for that, you need to increase the credit base that, that the businesses have. And you can do it by um, reducing government borrowing costs. So either you're effectively you're borrowing interest-free. And if, the, if for some reason the rating agencies don't approve of that, what you can do is you can take the credit that you create with your deposits and buy municipal bonds that are paying 4% interest, let's say. And then you can use that 4% to pay the interest on your, on your own debt. Uh, during the New Deal, it just struck me watching the debates. I mean, we, here we have the presidents arguing back, or the candidates arguing back and forth about things that, that are really not what are really worrying people. But in the New Deal, uh, Roosevelt had, well, he had a bank, which was called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. It wasn't even a bank, it was just a financial institution, but it was publicly owned. It was run by Jesse Jones, and he just gave Jesse Jones carte blanche to do whatever ever he wanted, and he was a very sharp and very um, moral man who, who just funded everything in sight that was going to improve, the, that was going to add to the well-being of the people, and that would create jobs. So they did roads, bridges, libraries, universities, um, dams, electricity for the farmers, et cetera. Things that, that in seven years they created this entire culture that, that we've had ever since. And I, actually there was a, I, when I went to, how much time do I have? When I went to Berkeley, tuition was free and it's now $12,000 a year. So I said that in a, in a presentation and I, I was, a, but I thought I'd better check and make sure because it did seem kind of outrageous that it would be free. And so I found this uh, professor who had written in his commencement speech. He said, uh, when, I went to Ber when I tell my students that when I went to Berkeley in the 60s, tuition was free, their jaws jo dropped to the floor. He said, and this is the reason he, he was a historian, or a, I'm not sure what, but anthropologist or something. Anyway, he was doing this archeological dig as if it was, ancient history because it was so foreign to what we have today and they were going around and identifying all the things that had been built in these seven years and what what was remarkable is not just all the things that they built but the whole sentiment behind them they have these little sayings you know the truth shall set you free and and sayings from all these famous people and they, and they painted these really neat little murals around and, and did little carvings and stuff I mean it was a real cultural phenomenon that we just we just don't have today and that was all done with a public bank effectively what they did was they just issued the credit and did it they didn't argue about it they didn't have um, actually the, rep the conservatives were opposed to the whole new deal of course but they couldn't stop them because they didn't need congressional appro approval so they just did it and it worked out very well it was it actually returned a very nice dividend to the people that what they did was they issued the credit first and then they borrowed the money from the treasury and then the treasury issued bonds and the people bought the bonds, um, you know, the liberty bond type things. I mean, it was kind of your patriotic duty. Everybody was in support of this whole thing. It wasn't like taxes. You didn't have to buy the bonds. 
but people wanted to buy the bonds. They wanted to help the country and they wanted the bit of interest they paid. So after paying the interest and their costs, they still turned a very nice profit at the end of, by 1945 when they, they also funded World War II, but it was, it was before that, during the New Deal, that they built all these amazing things just by issuing credit and funding it by borrowing. Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, create a new model that makes the old model obsolete. So the public banking model is that the government borrows from its own bank, returning the interest to the public. So this makes a sustainable system. Bank profits feed the economy rather than feeding off it. So for more information, um, the Public Banking Institute website is publicbankinginstitute.org and my own website is webofdebt.com and I have like over 150 articles that I've written on this subject on, the, on my website.